Okay, in this class session we're covering three issues that are kind of related, but not necessarily directly related. Transparency, intellectual property, and auditing. Um, I want you to be able to identify the nonprofit disclosures that are required by law, explain the challenge of balancing trade secrets with public disclosure, and describe the steps of a proper audit for a nonprofit organization. Uh, let's talk about re required and recommended disclosures. Some of this is refreshing. It will pretty much, this whole first column is just refreshing what we've already talked about from earlier in the semester. Um, by law, you have to disclose your 990, your 1023. Uh, these are both the tax forms you file with the IRS. The 990 is your annual tax form, and that has to be public for the last three years' filings. And the 1023 is the form you file to obtain your tax exempt status. Um, however long ago you filed that, 20, 30 years ago, or last year, it doesn't matter. You have to keep a, a copy of this available for public inspection. Um, in most states that require solicitation registration, there are disclosures involved there as well. It, like in Utah, for example, a bunch of what you file with the state is actually public information. And so anytime you're registering to solicit donations in any of the 40 states that require it, that information, a bunch of the information that you provide the state is part of public disclosure. Now, it, this doesn't necessarily mean that you stop there. When it comes to what nonprofits should be telling the world, there are other things to consider. For example, most nonprofits should do an annual report. And the truth is you want to do an annual report because it gives you an opportunity to brag about what you've accomplished, but it's also a great opportunity to disclose the important things that have happened. If you've had big leadership changes within your organization, uh, if you've taken on new programs, if you've taken on new funding obligations, any of those things will be included in an annual report. Um, you, by, as a general practice, if you're making more than $200,000 a year in revenue, you should probably be having audited financial statements and make those public. Um, the, there are some states, that if you're going to solicit donations in those states, they actually require audited financial statements above that threshold. Um, the audited financial statements basically mean your, your balance sheet, your cash flow statement, and your income statement, and you uh, have an auditor an external auditor review those and, and validate their authenticity. And if there are any financial statements you've released to the public that need to be restated because you did math wrong or you discovered some horrible um, truth about how the money has been spent, um, those financial restatements should also be made public. Really, when you're thinking about whether or not you should disclose information to the public, here are a few things to consider. First, that nonprofits have a public trust. And then while it's true that the 990 is a public disclosure document, it's not always sufficient in terms of what the public has a right to know by virtue of this public trust. It's important to remember that donors may feel or in fact be misled as a result of your failure to disclose. And if you're not going to disclose information to them, then donors will be making donations under false pretenses. And finally, individuals should not be protected at the expense of the organization. You know, way too often we see scandals in the nonprofit sector that involve insiders who are being protected because they don't want to disclose to the public the bad thing that happened. And if they were to let the person go, then it would become public about what occurred. But the reality is you don't want to do that. Um, anytime something goes wrong that the public has a right to know, uh, even if it's going to cost somebody their reputation, it's better to disclose. Uh, if you get caught protecting somebody and keeping information secret, it's going to be a lot worse for you than if you had just let them go and made the information public from the beginning. I'd be curious if any of you have examples you want to share in that regard. Okay, um, as far as the performance of nonprofit organizations is concerned and, and what's disclosed and what's not, one of the trends that's been increasing over the last decade or so is a group of people that are evaluating nonprofits based on publicly disclosed information. The prom most prominent of these organizations is Charity Navigator. Um, they rate thousands of nonprofits on a four point scale. Um, it's based on financial disclosures. They're starting to change to do performance-based evaluations, but they haven't really come up with anything yet. One thing I like about their website is that they do these really cool top 10 lists where they, um, where they sort of list like the top 10 overpaid nonprofit executives. It's kind of fun. Another one is GiveWell.org. They're actually partnering with Charity Navigator to improve their performance evaluation, so it's not just all financial. Um, they are very impact oriented. They do intensive work um, with a small number of nonprofits, um, and then they release their top recommended ones. This is so f sort of for the donors that want to make sure every dollar is having the biggest impact possible. GiveWell is giving, making themselves a name in this regard. 
Um, and then last is the Better Business Bureau. Uh, if you go to give.org, you can see the, the uh, national charity reports. They have standards of charity accountability in terms of what they think nonprofits should publicly release. And then for a bunch of national charities, several hundred of them, they release reports on how well these nonprofits do in releasing this information to the public. So this isn't so much an evaluation of their performance, not even of their financial performance, but it's just an evaluation of their disclosure. Um, and so these are places you can turn anytime you want to learn more about nonprofits. Um, now, if you really just want nothing but like 990s, for example, you can go to guidestar.org, and that's where you can download 990s for just about any nonprofit in the country. All right, so now we're moving on to intellectual property. And, and, and intellectual property is when you keep things from others, like secrets, for example, or a right to use information that you've published. Um, there are times where nonprofits shouldn't be sharing everything, and we're going to talk about what those are. The first, and I think one of the most important to understand, is what's called a trade secret. This is a form of intellectual property where you have a process, method, plan, or formula that's unique to an organization that the organization keeps secret. Um, the most famous example of a trade secret is the recipe for Coca-Cola. In fact, supposedly only two people in the world know the full recipe for Coca-Cola. Um, they keep it closely guarded. Um, they have people who, the people who know the recipe have signed non-disclosure agreements so they can be sued if they ever release it to the public. Again, the, the overall basic point is that this is information that's kept secret, and as a result, it comes with special legal protection. Um, you have to protect your trade secrets to preserve them. Oh, I forgot to say, you know, a really common trade secret in the nonprofit world is the donor list. A lot of nonprofits closely guard their donor list because it's basically their source of revenue for a lot of organizations, and, um, and so a donor list is a good example of something you want to keep secret. Virtually all organizations that have trade secrets should use non-disclosure agreements, meaning anybody who works for or with the organization should agree to not share uh, trade secret information with the public. You should make sure you maintain internal controls of secret information. If it's important enough, you should password protect all digital files. You should keep other things in locked file cabinets. Um, you basically do the things that a rational person would do when they want to keep something secret. And finally, you should use litigation. Nonprofits hesitate to sue people all the time because it feels contrary to their sort of socially motivated nature. But if you don't protect your trade secrets through litigation, you lose them. And then you don't get the benefit of the trade secret, which hopefully is helping your organization do better. And so if you lose your trade secret, it could really hurt your organization. If your organization is helping society, then it's going to have social impact as well. Um, let's talk about, there are three other kinds of intellectual property, and these always sort of come up when we talk about trade secrets. I'm just going to cover them quickly. One is copyright. This is a temporary exclusive right to copy, publish, or perform a fixed expression. A fixed expression is any time you say or write or, or paint or, or sing or whatever, anything that gets fixed in a medium. It might be a recording. It might be written or pr drawn on paper. Um, it might, uh, but uh, as long as a fixed expression exists and you're the originator of that expression, then um, you have exclusive right to copy, publish, or perform it. And other people can't without your, without you telling them, without your permission, basically. Um, nonprofits have all kinds of copyright protections. They publish manuals. They have their websites, which are copyrighted. Um, and so there are a lot of reasons for nonprofits to have and protect copyright. Uh, I'm sure you have a bunch of questions about copyright, which we can talk about in class. Another form of protection is a patent. This is where you get a temporary exclusive right to recreate or use an invented object, process, recipe, or design. Um, so when you invent something, you patent it. Uh, patents are temporary. Um, the reason they're temporary is because we want that knowledge created by the patent to go into the public sphere and eventually become publicly available. This is why um, medicine that was invented by big pharmaceutical companies eventually turns generic. It's because their patent on the, on the medicine expires, and then everybody can make it. And that makes the world a better place. Lastly, there's something called trademark. Trademark is where you have exclusive right to use specific words or symbols to indicate the source of a product or service. So for example, um, any product you look at, uh, look at your laptops, there's a logo there um, that's probably got words and symbols together, and that tells you where your laptop came from. Um, this is an exclusive right to use, you, the company that produced it has an exclusive right to use these words or symbols, and nobody else is allowed to use them. 
this is a public policy reason because trademarks make our life easier right if you if you trust you know a certain source for a certain product then you should be able to know that the product you're buying actually comes from that source and if you see a knockoff product right that's copying the the words or symbols in the trademark then it turns out it's coming from a different place but you don't have a way of knowing that and that's why trademark protections exist um, I'm sure you'll have more questions about trademarks, but uh, we'll talk about those in class. And trademark, again, nonprofits have an interest in trademarking things. And the reason is because, you know, it's important that they protect their brand and their image. Okay, um, you know, it's an interesting question whether or not exclusive intellectual property is contrary to the public trust given to nonprofits, and we can talk about that. And also, you know, can you think of some other examples of nonprofit trade secrets besides the donors list? All right, last, we're going to talk about the financial audit process. There are a few things to begin with first. You should have at least one board member in your nonprofit who's a financial expert, somebody who can understand financial statements and an accounting process. Um, if you don't have one, then you need to recruit one because this is a pretty big deal. Um, you should have been operating in a way that's amenable to the audit process. What happens when a, when a financial auditor comes in is they evaluate your accounting methods to make sure that they follow the rules for general accounting practices. And that means you need to be keeping good records of your financial expenditures and, and revenues. And if you're not keeping good records, then it's going to be hard for them to audit. In fact, the truth is you'll fail the audit. Um, and every nonprofit should have an audit committee um, or a finance committee that oversees the audit process and the financial expert or experts on your board should be a part of that committee. This is how the audit process works and it's important to note that this should be done every year. Um, basically the board initiates the audit process and what they do is they solicit, evaluate, and select an auditing firm. That auditing firm then reviews financial records and methods to make sure that they're well done and accurate. And then the auditor issues an opinion and financial statements. We're going to talk about the kind of opinion that's issued by an auditor. The important point is that it needs to be what's called an unqualified opinion, which sounds sort of counterintuitive because why would you want anything that's unqualified? Well, the reason you want an unqualified opinion is because there are no limitations or qualifications when the auditor says that your financial statements are accurate. A qualified opinion means they're reserving or, or qualifying their recommendation based on certain problems that they saw. Well, once the auditor issues the opinion and the financial audited financial statements and the board reviews and approves the audit, um, if there's a problem, this is when the board needs to fix it. So that's the basic idea. Um, uh, there are more in the slides if you want to know the, 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 the basics, but uh, we're going to skip those because uh, you can review those details later in the uh, written slides. Um, you know, the, the, what's interesting about, uh, about auditing in the nonprofit is that uh, the auditable, the, uh, the, there are, there's more than just money that can be audited in a nonprofit. In fact, pretty much state government, every state government has a, a, a performance auditing division and they don't audit financials instead they audit the performance of organizations and so really what that means is that is that everything important can be audited um, and in fact it probably should be and so if there's something important in your organization that can be measured it should probably be audited and so you might audit the effectiveness of your operations you might audit whistleblower reports and make sure that they were followed up upon. You might audit your impact measurement process or your ethics and conflicts of interest compliance. Um, these are all examples of non-financial things that can and should be audited within an organization. In all cases, an audit procedure should be created and followed and initiated. And in these cases, all these should be managed by the board of directors. Uh, we'll ask some questions together when we talk about the audit process. Um, but, you know, I'm more interested in the second question. What do you do if you encounter a major problem in the course of an audit? How do you respond? Um, we're going to discuss that together. Okay, so that's the end of this class session, and we'll see you in class.